All right, here we go again, everybody. Another amplifier arrives from Hawaii. This time, a 62 Vibrolux brown face amp. Complaint? A possible bad power transformer. Let's see what's going on with it. All right, here we go. Initial power-up test. I've got it hooked to my Variac. All the tubes are removed. Power switch is on. I'm just going to bring up the Variac slowly. So this is voltage. And this is current. All right, so we'll just bring her up slow. Look at that current. I can't even bring up maybe a volt. We're pulling an amp. So you know what happened if I give it full power. So let's see if we can uh, buzz out the transformer, see if there's any type of a short, but I suspect it's cooked. I'm still shaking down this Hioki meter, so we're going to use it for this repair too. So first thing we'll check, of course, is, is my line cord shorted to ground? No. Okay. And the meter does work. Okay. All right. I'm still working on trying to figure out how to disable the little beep beep beep. Okay. But right now we'll just deal with it. All right. Ground. Let's check our high voltage windings. Now remember, there's a center tap, so you should have some continuity to ground. In this case, though, I'm seeing 30 ohms. Let's check the other side. Same deal, like 30 ohms. Let's check, check the uh, 5 volt lines. Okay, well, it appears as though our issue is right here with the high voltage windings. Yeah, so between windings, I'm seeing 1.6 ohms. I think we found our short. All right, guys. Well, I did buy a new power transformer. Got a classic tone, and this is a drop-in replacement for the Vibrolux. So let's get that installed, and then we'll retest initial power. All right, we're just going to clip these wires. Because obviously there's no value left in the transformer. I just want to leave myself a little trail here, although it's pretty obvious where all this stuff goes. We'll just snippety doo da him, get him out. That guy wants to hang on, doesn't he? Okay. Now you see this does not have those 100 ohm resistors on the lamp assembly. That's because the filaments have a center tap. So they don't use that in all the amps. Okay. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Anyway, I'll get this out. We'll slide in the new one, wire it up, fire it back up. All right, there's the old crispy critter. Here's our replacement transformer. So remember on that one we had under 2 ohms across the high voltage windings. So here is the classic tone. 67 ohms. There's no center tap. Quite a difference. Alright, let's get the new one in. Alright, so like we did in the last video, we got the old overhead camera set up so you guys can see as I'm doing it. Giving away all my secrets, though, guys. I don't know if I like this. But, there it is. There's the amp. Let's hit it. All right, here we go. It's time to wire in that power transformer. I've got it bolted into place. place. The first thing you'll notice is that the ground wire for the power cord is still using that crummy spade terminal. That's just temporary for the initial testing. Then I'm going to solder that to the chassis. Next thing I like to do is get all my wire routing down and trim these guys to the length that I want them to be. Okay, so we got our 5 volt winding, we got our high voltage. They're going to land on the rectifier tube socket. So I'm probably going to cut them somewhere around here. Okay, then you got your filament wiring. Now, this normally went up here to the dial lamp and then folded back and fed the tube. This is high current wiring. I prefer to swing it direct to the tube 
and then come over to the lamp with say 22 gauge wire since it really doesn't draw any current. I've always found it strange that Fender came up here and went back there. Okay, So this is going to go direct to the tube. These two black wires is our 120 volts. One will go to the fuse holder, one goes over here to the power switch. Then you got all this fruit striping going on, right? So now this one here, you got to be cautious with. This red with the green stripe is actually a bias tap, okay? Don't ground that. I've seen guys do that, and guess what? You could possibly hurt your new transformer, okay? These two fruit stripers, though, are grounds. Center tap of the 6-volt winding, center tap of the high voltage. They're going to go right back here like the others did. And then this orange one, you're like, what the heck's that? That's actually an internal ground for the case of the transformer. So that is also going to be soldered here at this point. All right. So I do have something set up to do that high temperature soldering. I'm sure that you guys know what it is. But first, let's cut and dress the leads. All right, let's get these wires pre-cut for the lengths that I need. So what I like to do is just kind of go inch over the chassis. Snip, snip. Okay. Same with the power cord. Just going to kind of route him like so. Snippity-doo-dah. So cutting this wire reminds me of a little story. I've never told this story, and you guys would probably like it. Of course, I was in the Air Force. I went through a lot of training in there, okay? And uh, part of the training was is lacing, connecting wires, doing wire wrap, you know, lot, lots of different operations with wiring. Well, we had this guy that was afraid to cut wire. So it's like, it's like this bias line, right? It's, it's like, I don't know, foot and a half long. And I know I want to land right here for a reason that I'll show you guys here in a little bit. So I'm not going to leave it this long. I'm not going to cut it here, right? So what I, what I would do is just kind of equal it up with these guys, right? Cut. Off you go. But this guy that I was in the service with would sit there and stare at the wiring. It's like he's afraid that, I don't know, he'd get too short or something. You know, I mean, we've left plenty of slack here. There's nothing to worry about, but... For some reason, he couldn't make that decision. <laughs> it was kind of freaky. He ended up getting booted out for some other issues. But uh, I, I just thought maybe you guys would enjoy that little story. <laughs> uh, anyway, so the filaments are going to go over here. Now, I want these to route around the back side of everything. Keep it out of the way. So we're going to let those be a little bit longer. So how about that? How's that look? Oh, geez, should I cut it? <laughs> All right, let's strip the ends, and we'll start landing them. So I think what I might do is just leave this 18-gauge uh, wire that they used coming up here to the lamps. The tube sockets over there have plenty of room for the third wire set. So that means that this can just remain the way it is. Okay. So we'll get the filaments hooked up first and then we'll do the high voltage and then our ground. So what I'm going to do is take a little bit of solder wick clear the bottom hole that they didn't use on the tube socket. They filled it, but it wasn't used, which would give me a nice landing spot for those filament leads. There's one. See through that hole. And the other one's already open. Cool deal. Let's get those wrapped in there. Solder them up. All right. Doesn't look like they're touching anything that they shouldn't. Now, later on, 
we're going to be removing this ground strap that goes from 8 and 1 so that I can install some current shunts because I like to monitor the current through my output tubes when I set bias. So let's do the 5 volt windings next. See how that wire just popped right out of there guys? It's more of that nifty push through the socket wiring. I'm going to go ahead and wrap all these so we get a little bit better mechanical bond. Yeah, I know. It's worked forever. Why would it start failing now? I get it. But that's just the way I do things. I mean, I could push it through. But I'd rather have a little bit better bite on that. So there's a little solder in here messing with me. There we Alright, let's see if I can get it this time. So the fill nuts go on pins 2 and 8. And then this little guy here is taken off to the filter caps. There we go. Now over here we've got our the red wires, right? And this was the high voltage that came in. And you see this little runner. That's for the bias. So they come over here, they go through a little resistor. And then that's how they get their uh, negative bias. And what I'm going to do for this guy is add variable bias. So he can dial in the output tube. So if you want to run it cold, you can do whatever you want but in this stock configuration there is no adjustment I always thought that was odd it's like if I didn't want any adjustment I'd probably just use the cathode bias method right if I got negative bias wouldn't it be nice to be able to vary it right, I'm gonna finish uh, hooking up the 120 here Then we're going to fire this thing up with no tubes installed and make sure that the power transformer has all the proper outputs. And I went ahead and uh, hooked up that little runner for the negative bias. We're just going to see if he's present. Remember, Old crunchy cap there, still original. Shouldn't pose any problem. But that obviously will have to be replaced before I put this amp into operation. Okay. All right now we got these three grounds that need to go here. So I'm going to hook these together and see if I can do this in one shot. Oops. All, right. All right, to simplify the process, I pre-twisted these guys and tinned them. So we're going to lay them right there. Should be a fairly simple job when you got the right soldering iron. And you know what that is, right? That's right. Sit back, relax, light up an old ghoul. Small Ceramus. Here we go. A lot of people wonder where ghouls come from. Well, they come from all over. They have... A lot of ghouls come from Portugal. Success.
So for our variable bias, I'm going to set a terminal board here, which this tap will go to. We're going to disconnect this wire and connect those together. Then there's going to be a 10K pot that will reside here on the chassis. And no, I'm not going to drill a hole. We're actually going to epoxy the back of the pot to this chassis, just like I did on that Princeton that you guys saw a few videos back. Okay. We have to add a resistor for that, and we're going to change this cap. And when we're done, we should be able to vary our negative bias from, say, negative 20 to negative 50 volts. Now here we go again. The initial power up with the new power transformer. So I'm back on the Variac. I'm just going to bring it up to, say, 30, 40 volts. I'm just going to go around and make sure that voltages are alive and obviously that we're not drawing excessive current. Okay, So I'm bringing up the Variac right now and I'm watching the amp meter. I see no activity, which is good. There shouldn't be because we're unloaded. I do see the filament light coming on. So we're on ground on one side and the meter is AC volts. So here is one side the high voltage. Here's the other. Okay, so I see about 137 volts. So if I were to vary my input voltage, that varies with it. Good thing. All right. Now, let's make sure that our 5 volt supply is good. I'm sure it is. Remember, I'm only at about 50 volts. So we're not going to see 5 volts here. Oops. 2.5 volts. That's plenty good. Now, let's check for the presence of negative voltage. So we go to ground, DC volts, negative 20 volts. And that's off of that current tap, okay? But we are going to use this tap that I have not connected yet when we put in the new variable bias. All right, so I jumped ahead of you guys last night. I uh, wasn't able to roll this on camera, but I can show you what I did for the new bias selection. Okay, so the red wire with the green stripe goes here to the terminal board, and this wire feeds the resistor like it used to on the old circuit. But I updated the circuitry to reflect the Super Reverb AB. 763 circuit okay so now it comes in it's kind of hard to see but there's a 470 ohm resistor here it goes to the diode here's our filter cap with positive going to ground now the output goes through the pot and this is a 10k pot and this feeds the negative bias to the grids of the output tubes and there's a 27k resistor here to ground so I'm going to fire this up measure the voltages, make sure we get a good swing. Tubes are not installed, so when the tubes get installed, obviously that's going to change this negative bias a little bit. But initially, I just want to make sure it fires up and we can adjust the bias. Right? Here we go. All right, it's time to measure that bias. I've got the Hioki meter set up on volts, and right now it's auto-ranged into the millivolt scale. I'm monitoring one of the grid pins to the output tube because that's where we want the negative bias, right? So the pot right now is like mid-scale. I'm just going to plug it in. Remember, there's no tubes installed. Beep, beep, beep. All right. It's like negative 53 volts. I can go up to about 60. And I can go down to negative 45. So that's probably a good range. So when we put in the tubes, I'm going to advance the negative bias close to maximum so that we don't shock those tubes and I'll be able to tweak the bias in. But first I need to install the current shunts so we can actually watch the current through the output tubes. So we'll get to that point, but at least we know that we have variable negative bias now. All right, next, I'm going to get in here on the 6L6 tube sockets. We're going to do a little bit of work on those. Got to get these wires out of the way. 
What the plan is, is I'm going to install the 1 ohm current shunts in the place of these ground straps. So currently these go from pins 1 to 8 to ground. I'm going to remove that. These 1 ohm resistors will go from 8 to ground. We're going to utilize pin 1 to install the 1.5K grid resistors that this model is missing. I'm also going to swap out these 470 ohm resistors, but I thought for fun, let's test them. So I've got the meter on the K range, okay? So now it's not going to auto range. So we won't hear that beep. So here is one of them. 650 ohms, that exceeds the 10% tolerance, doesn't it? I always see these odd tolerance guys, it's no surprise. And this one's a little over 520 ohms. Alright, so they're coming out. We'll reconfigure things to make it a little bit easier to measure the bias through the output tubes. Yep, there he is. Snozoramus on the job. Makes easy work on these ground connections. Okay. Alright, so those are lifted. Put that thing out of the way so it doesn't torch me. And since uh, Fender just pushes their wires through the sockets, these ground braids fly right off. And get in here. I try to be very careful when I'm doing this stuff not to bend other wiring because it's kind of brittle. So I don't want to cause more problems. Okay. Those are out of the way. Get our current shunts installed, the grid resistors, so on and so forth, and retest. Well, there's a little current shunts in place. You're going to solder these onto pin 8. Don't make the mistake of putting it to pin 1 or you'll have no current through your output tubes. Okay. These guys are laying about where I want them. Good old snozzly going. solder in there to transfer the heat. There she goes. Doesn't take long for that solder to cool down laying on that chassis. It's kind of the beauty of a metal chassis. You know, if you had aluminum, you'd have to set a bunch of studs in here to do the job. guy up a little bit so he's not laying on the filament wire. Okay, so now got our two test points to measure the current through the output tubes. I'm going to get these uh, 470s out of my way. The main reason is so I'm going to replace them, but I also want them out of the way because they're blocking access from the new grid resistors. Okay, wow. This guy is actually like twisted around there. That's amazing. I'm sure these have been changed in the past. Come on. Oh 
Oh, he's stubborn. All right, anyway, this is one of the grid wires. What I'm going to do is go into pin one with the 1.5K resistor, and he'll swing over here to five. And then these grid feeds, wherever it went, right there, is going to have to come around the other side, okay? On some of the fenders, they flip these sockets around. This is all opposite. So I'm going to have to extend these wires to make it. But when we're done, we'll have those nice grid block resistors installed, which should lower the noise level on the amp. So I'll get a little solder work in here and clean this up. Get a resistor in there. And then I'll struggle with that 470 ohm guy that doesn't want to come out. Something came out. Oh, another wire popped out. Imagine that. All right, got most of this cleaned up. Some of you have been writing in saying, hey, where's the, the bottle of wine? Where, where's the wine, Terry? Well, so to clue you guys in, I'm actually off this week. So I've been coming out here in the mornings. So instead of seeing... Uh, wine you might be seeing a little coffee or a little tea okay so yeah you know I've got that uh, little wine habit but I don't get up in the morning and start drinking it if that's what you think I usually have you know a glass or two while I'm out here putzing away as the wife would call it um, try to keep it under control. I mean, it's like everybody else, you know, weekend, I might uh, do a little more than two glasses. No more than a bottle, though, okay? All right, so you see where I put these uh, 470 ohm resistors? They're not laying inside of the socket like Fender did, okay? And the reason they're not there is number one I needed room for our new little grid resistors okay and if you swing them off the side like this in the future when you gotta work on the amp it's a lot easier to get to the tube pins than if you have some big stupid resistor in the way right the only thing you gotta watch is the screw that's under here don't really want the resistor lead to hit it because that would be a uh, kaboom moment, right? So when you get done, just kind of bring them up, hook them up so they float well above that screw, and you'll never have a problem. All right, I need to now extend these grid leads. So this was the configuration. You may say, "Well, can't you just put that over there and then you know go over here?" No, you can't because you have a feedback issue because then you've reversed the polarity on your output tubes and she'll squeal like a banshee so you have to leave them where they're at so I mean I could like say well I'll just cram that over there that'll make it well no I think I'm gonna go ahead and extend these leads so that they can lace around the chassis nicely and then we're really close to the initial test zoom in a little bit here for you all right there's our grid leads I'm going to extend them okay so it's just like I do those filter caps to extend my wiring I also J hook them in okay I'd rather do this than to tear into that eyelet board and try to fish those leads out from underneath do more harm than good so this method is just as strong as the wire don't leave any 
pretty sharp edges. Get a little heat shrink on there. Now I got plenty to work with and I'll be able to lay it down against the chassis which helps with noise reduction especially on these grid leads. Another little trick that Fender did found out that routing these close to the chassis would reduce noise. That's why when I get amps and you know leads are flying up in the air kind of drives me nuts they're antennas right so if the antenna is close to this metal it suppresses that noise well I've inspected everything looks pretty good so what I'd like to do at this point before we install tubes is just make sure that we see negative bias on both of the grids because that's really important. Okay, so I'm gonna plug it in. Good. Good. Okay, you saw that that was around uh, negative 60 volts. So when we put in the output tubes, they're gonna run extremely cold. But that's the way you want to start these amps up. All right. So now I'm gonna install the owner's tubes that he sent with this amp. And we'll put a dummy load on it and see if there's any life in the Vibrolux. So now we'll change out these grid caps. Even though they may be working, I do this as a precaution to save your output tubes. These will be returned to the owner. So he can put them back in if he wants. But I have seen these leak. And I've seen what it does to those expensive output tubes. Cheap insurance, guys. These sprigs are only like, I don't know bucks piece something like that sometimes they fight you a little bit going in there you gotta love these eyelets try doing this kind of work on a circuit board quickly develop an appreciation for these eyelets. I'm also going to replace these electrolytics. They have been replaced in the past, but I don't know their history. They look kind of old to me. So get some nice fresh ones in there. I'll buzz out the resistors on the boards here. Make sure none of those are way out of tolerance. And then we can hook a guitar up to this thing. See how it sounds. Okay, that one needs a little bit of assistance. A little solder to help transfer the heat. Boom. All right, one thing you never want to forget to do is clean these shorting arms on the input jacks. So you take one of these little burnishing tools, just get
get in there and polish up that contact. This is a source of noise, that static kind of lightning popping you get. It's usually these contacts. So this little tool is called an OB1. You can buy these through Mauser Electronics for a couple bucks a piece. It's a good investment. They'll last you forever. Don't ever clean these with a file or sandpaper. Use the burnishing tool. Well, here we go. Full power up time for the Vibrolux. I've installed a set of tubes. They're not new, but they're okay. Got a dummy load hooked up, and we're on the Variac. My meter is looking at one of the shunt resistors so we can see the current through that tube. So I'm going to bring up our power nice and slow. There's about 50 volts applied. So here in a moment, hopefully we'll start seeing these millivolts climb on the meter, indicating current flow through the tube. Okay, there is 80 volts applied. Nothing yet. Oh, here she comes. All right, good deal. So there's 90 volts applied. Remember, I've got that negative bias really throttled back right now. But what's important is just to see we have current through the tubes. So that's one. There's the other. Good deal. I'm going to take it like to 100 volts. Let it stabilize. Now, let's increase the bias. All right. 17 there. What do we got here? About the same. Now, it's really jumping around. Makes me think that the tremolo is running. See that quite often. So let's hook up a little magic jumper. Let's see if that makes a difference. It sure does. Okay. Another one of my rules that I violated. All right. Always disable your tremolo when you're setting bias, guys. Okay. So there she is, 17.5. I like that. Take another look over here. Look at there. Those tubes are perfectly balanced. That's amazing. All right, let's go up to 120 volts or so. All right, I ran out of adjustment. So that means the resistor that I selected for the other side of that pot, the 27K, is too low. All right. Let me change that resistor right so I can get the bias and the range that I want it. All right, I removed the 27K. I put a 10K in its place, which was actually the initial value that I was going to use. Always works that way, doesn't it? Okay, she's up. Still monitoring the current. Here it comes. Bring the bias up. Okay. See, now we can dial in the current. So we'll set it at my typical 28 milliamps for the 6L6s. Looks good. All right. Now let's connect a signal to it and see if we get anything out of this amp. All right, we're powered up again with the new switch installed. Leader is hooked up to the normal channel right now. Got the scope monitoring the output. There it is. Looks pretty good. Let's check the bright channel. Yep. 
good deal. So it's coming along nicely. I've got some caps on the eyelet board that I need to change and then we'll do a live performance. Yeah. Hey Brian! <laughs> Don't be calling me names! <laughs> you got some nice amps, dude. Well, you're the Cousinator. That's I'm right. The, I'm the Cousinator, and I'm here to tell you this is the best badass amp you've sent here yet. <laughs> as soon as possible. <laughs> 